I would have never looked there. That's one, two.
Good morning and welcome to all of you from Good, uh, Shepherd of the Valley and St. George and any visitors this morning, welcome. Because of the concerns of the world this morning, I am inviting us to a minute of silence before we begin our prayers this morning, fervent prayers for peace in our world. Amen. Good morning. Siblings in Christ, as we gather today, our congregations would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded traditional land of the first people of Seattle the Duwamish people, as well as the Salish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish and Salish tribes. We are brought here today to glimpse the hope that Christ has for us. Open our hearts to receive that hope. We are brought here today to be healed of our fears. Heal us, poor Jesus, with your love and power. Come, let us receive the vision and healing love of God. Praise be to God, who continues to bless, restore, and transform us.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us and lead us, that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news in Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. You are the descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. <laughs> The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We pray together as one congregation, spanning time and space. Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Could I have the children come up 
and join me over here by the chair. Or you can sit and listen by where you, oh, I'll sit on the edge of the chair. Hi. I see you over there. You don't have to come all the way up here. So I have a question for you, and adults, you can answer too quietly in your head. But if you're a kid, you can answer out loud. How many sides are there on a triangle? Adults, if you're still thinking, we have problems. There's three sides on a triangle. Can you make a triangle with your hands? Looks like that, right? How many sides are there on a square? Ten? No. Four. There's four. Can you make a square with your hands? Kind of hard. Right? You can make these sides. How many sides are there on a circle? Whoa. It's hard to say, right? Can you make a circle with your hands? A circle doesn't really have sides. You could say it has one big side, I guess. But it's not like a triangle or a square, right? It just has one line that kind of keeps going. And when you get to where it, the line stopped, it's right back at the beginning. And it kind of keeps going. Can you make a circle with not just your hands, but with your arms? What happens, what happens when you make a circle with your arms? What does that look like? looks like a hug, right? This morning you're going to hear a story about Jesus and the way people look at Jesus. And for once, for one amazing moment in this story, people are not looking at Jesus and seeing just one side or two sides or even four sides. They're looking at Jesus and he looks, his love kind of looks like a circle. It looks like something that has no sides looks like a hug. So as you're listening to the stories read this morning, and as you're looking at the faces of the people around you, try and think about what people look like when they don't have sides anymore, when they're just like a circle. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for your love. Your love is like a circle. Help us to draw a circle that is wide so that your love can surround the world. Amen. Thank you for spending this time with me. A reading from Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking to God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with the Lord, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites that he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, and the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Please read responsively. The Lord is king. Let the people tremble. The Lord is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Let them confess God's name, which is great and awesome. God is the Holy One. Almighty 
Proclaim the greatness of the Lord and fall down before God's footstool. God is the Holy One. You spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept your testimonies and the decree that you gave them. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord and worship upon God's holy hill, for the Lord our God is the Holy One. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians. Since then, we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside, but their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the old covenant, the same veil is there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. Word of God, word of life. Gospel acclamation. Alleluia. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to Jesus. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw the glory of Jesus and the two men who stood with him. Just as the men were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. People of Shepherd of the Valley Lutheran Church and St. George Episcopal Church, grace and peace to you this day in the name of Jesus. My name is Meredith Dodd, and I'm a United Methodist pastor here in the Pacific Northwest. And I have to tell you two things before we start this morning on the sermon. The first is, this is my first time preaching in an actual physical pulpit in two years. (laughs) 
So I'm glad Pastor Andy picked a nice light week where nothing was going on. <laughs> but that means a couple of things for us this morning. One, in United Methodist tradition, when the Holy Spirit comes, sometimes the Holy Spirit comes out, leaks out your eyes. And that might happen this morning. And if that happens, we know that that's what's going on with the Spirit. The second is, I haven't preached for actual people in a while, so if you can't hear me, just go like this, and we'll figure it out. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was young, the thing that I thought was cooler than any other book in my house was the telephone book. I loved, remember telephone books? I loved the telephone book because I could open it up and find the name of anybody I knew and it was right there, printed in a real live book. Sometimes with their middle initial, and their address and their phone number. There was something about looking up people in the phone book that made them feel real. They were in a book. And so one day when I was probably eight or nine years old, I thought, you know, I wonder if the phone book even has the names of teachers. <laughs> because I had an idea that maybe the teachers didn't really just live at school, that they were real live people. And so I went home and I got out my telephone book and I looked up the name of every teacher I knew and you know what? They were in the telephone book too. It was amazing. This proved, I thought, that my teachers were real human beings. But then I started to look around my town and I realized that it wasn't just seeing their names in a book that proved that my teachers were human. It was their stories. It was their faces. It was the things I saw them doing when they weren't being my teachers. Teachers sometimes smoked cigarettes, I learned. I saw one teacher at a birthday party, and it turned out she was somebody's aunt, not just my teacher. I had one teacher one day come into class and said, I have some news, I've just adopted a baby, and I've brought him here so that you can meet him. There was something about knowing that my teachers were real people that made it easier to see them, that made it easier to love them. It made it easier to understand why they did some of the things that they did because I was lucky enough to have teachers who didn't just teach me about grammar and math and science, but my teachers would teach me what to do when I got bullied on the playground. They challenged me when I made a mistake and they knew I could do better. They were gentle with me when my mother got sick. I thought I would learn about who my teachers really were by finding their names in the phone book. But when all of these things started to happen, when my eyes opened to all of these things that were already happening, I started to learn what my teachers had known for a long, long time. If we want to be in relationship with the people around us, we have to look not just at what our eyes can see on the surface, but we have to see other people with the eyes of our hearts. This is a hard thing for kids. When we talk to people about children, 
talk to children about their communities, we tend to identify people as what they do. There's the doctor. There's the garbage man. There's Joe's mom. People have functions. They have names, and if you look them up in the phone book, they have phone numbers. They have jobs. But if we want to grow up, we have to be able to see not just the function of a person, not just the flat surface of our world, but we have to start to see complexity. A person can be more than one thing at a time. I think about experiences from my own adult life. The person that I knew in the homeless encampment turned out also to be my mechanic. When I was working as a hospital chaplain, I started to realize that the nurses that I was working with had also, just a year ago, been patients. Nurses get sick, too. It turns out that even soldiers who kill people in a war, even soldiers are somebody's son and somebody's big brother. When we see people in only one way, we diminish their humanity. We diminish their divinity. If we see people with only the eyes of a single moment in time, we start to lose the ability to see the world through the eyes of hope. To see people not only as they are in this single moment, but as they might become. When we see people in only one way, we forsake the ability to see what God sees, our infinite belovedness. Today for our gospel lesson, we heard the story of the transfiguration. Jesus goes up the mountain to pray, only this time he brings with him three of his friends, Peter, James, and John. And in that moment between wakefulness and sleep, they catch a glimpse of Jesus, and for the first time, they see him as they've never seen him before. Jesus is shining like the sun. He's sitting there talking with the ancestors, with Moses, with Elijah, and all of the things that Jesus is and was and will be. For one brief shining moment, all of those things are right there for them to see in plain sight all at once. The moment fades away, as moments do, and Peter says rightfully to Jesus, it's good, it's good for us to be here. And then as Peter does, he keeps running his mouth and he says, let's build three booths to commemorate this great occasion. And before he can keep talking, a voice interrupts. A cloud surrounds them there on the mountain and they hear a voice say, this is my chosen one, my beloved. Listen to him. And they walk back down the mountain. And Jesus continues doing what he's been doing, teaching and traveling and healing people. And scripture says the disciples are quiet. And I suspect they were quiet for a long, long time. For just a few seconds, they get to see everything that Jesus is. They get to see what makes Jesus glow. And I imagine that the way they look at him from then on is never the same. There's two things about Peter in this story that I noticed that I hadn't noticed before. Of course he wants to build something, build a monument and remember 
this experience, but I noticed he doesn't want to build one big monument. He doesn't want to build one big booth for Jesus and Moses and Elijah all to hang out together. He wants to separate this experience. He wants to separate it into three booths, one for Moses, the law, one for Elijah, the prophets, one for Jesus, the gospel. But it turns out that those things can't be separated. They're all part of who Jesus is. He is law and prophet and gospel. In the past and the present and the future, he is birth and death and rising again, all at the same time. Now, usually at this point in stories involving Peter, he gets in trouble. (laughs) There are other stories where Jesus snaps at Peter and says, get back. Or somebody tells him that he doesn't have enough faith. But in this version of this, this story, Peter and James and John instead hear a voice It says the same things that that voice down by the river said the day Jesus was baptized by John. For one brief moment, Jesus' friends also get to hear the voice of God saying, this is my chosen, my beloved. Listen. And after that, Peter shuts up for a little bit. He's silent. They all are silent. And I like to think that he keeps listening and he keeps looking for that glow even after they come back down from the mountain. There's a writer from Nigeria who I like, Chim Amanda Ngozi Adichie is her name. And she writes about the danger of a single story. The danger of insisting that someone can only be one thing at a time. At best, she says, having a single story in our minds limits what we can see. If you can only see that a person is living in a homeless encampment, you won't be able to see that they can also fix your car. But at worst, she writes, having a single story is what fuels our stereotypes. It fuels our hatred. It can even start a war. And the trouble with the danger of a single story, she says, The trouble is not that the single stories that we hold in our mind aren't true. Sometimes they are. The danger is that they're not complete. During those few moments up on the mountain with Jesus, Peter and James and John see him in all of his completeness. They don't just see the single story of who they thought Jesus was. They see him through the eyes of God. And we know from scripture that after someone has met God, has encountered the holy, even after that encounter has ended, there's something about that glow that tends to linger on. This is why When Moses comes down from the mountaintop, this is why he veils his face. Because the people around him say, hey, you still seem to be glowing over there. He's still shining from that life-changing encounter that he has with the holy. And Jesus glows in just that same way, no matter what he's doing. If he's doing something boring, like walk into the next town even when he's reminding them of hard truths, like how it profits them nothing if they gain the whole world but lose themselves. 
Jesus keeps glowing, even when he's doing something so, so hard, like praying that he won't really have to die. Because even when Jesus is dazzling with light, even when Jesus is conversing with the ancestors of the faith, even up on the mountaintop, Jesus doesn't skip the hard parts of the story. Because when he's up on the mountain talking with Moses and Elijah, they're not just talking about the weather. They're talking about not how great it is that they're all so close to God all the time, but they're talking about how pretty soon, like every other person on earth, Jesus is going to have to die. The transfiguration isn't about seeing Jesus as fully divine. It's about seeing it all the divinity and the humanity, the glory and the suffering. Seeing someone as they truly are means not being blind to the hard parts of the story. It's taking a good, long, loving look at someone who's not going to last forever, sometimes someone who is suffering and dying and loving them anyway. It is in this way. By seeing the beauty and the complexity and the pain of someone's story, it is by seeing in this way that we find hope. And right now, our world is thirsty for some hope. When Paul considers this moment up on the mountain, he writes this. He says, since we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. All of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror. All of us are being transformed into that same image. It's not just Moses who glows when he's had an encounter with the divine. It's not just Jesus. It's every single one of us. What would the world be like if we remembered that? Now, you may never have sat with prophets. I don't know what Lutherans and Episcopalians do. I suppose it's possible. But you may never have sat with prophets or heard a voice emerge from a cloud. You may never even have climbed a mountain. Most of us don't get those kind of transcendent experiences. But I wonder if there has been a time in your life, and it may have just lasted four or five seconds, I wonder if there has been a time when you saw the world as connected and not separate. I wonder if there has been a time in your life when you looked around and you felt nothing but awe and gratitude, something that your ancestors knew as well, a time when you felt a love that was beyond all understanding. Maybe it was when you looked up and realized that above that cedar tree there was a bald eagle Maybe it was when you looked at a child and you realized she had the eyes of her great-grandmother. Maybe it was during a hard time next to someone's bed when you felt their spirit slipping from this life into the next. Maybe you have had such a time. And when you try to describe what happened, you can give the facts, you can give the information that you might find in a phone book. There was a bird in that tree. She had pretty eyes. I was there when they died. But you realize 
if you've had such an experience, that those four or five seconds are so much more than facts. And you just don't have the words. Do you remember a time like that? Times like that don't happen very often. But when they do, we are transfigured just like Jesus. We know we are beloved. We feel connected to everything around us, the past, the present, and the future, birth, death, resurrection. The veil seems to lift, and just for a few seconds, if we looked at ourselves in the mirror, we would see, as Paul reminds us, that we too are reflections of the image of God. Most of the time, we don't look at the world this way. We compartmentalize, just like Peter. Oops. We sort people into friends and enemies. We fall prey to the dangers of that single story, and our minds start to close, and our hearts start to close too. And we start to think that what we can see right in this moment, that that's all there is. What if, before we fossilized into a single story, what if we took a deep breath and remembered those moments of awe and wonder and love and transfiguration? During that time on the mountain, the disciples realized there was so much more to Jesus than just the part they could usually see. And friends, that is true for everyone you will meet. Those people you love and those people you find almost impossible to love. Like Jesus, Those folks are beloved by God. Like Jesus, their lives too are informed by the lives of invisible ancestors. And like Jesus, they too know deep joy and tremendous suffering. And this is just as true during times of war as it is during times of peace. Beyond what we can see on the surface, there is hope. There is hope. And when we see that hope, it glows. My prayer for you this week is that you will not just see one single story, but the story of a God whose love makes the world shine like the sun. I pray that you will not turn away from things that are hard, but you will turn toward this world's complexity with holy boldness. And I pray that when the light fades and the voices seem silent, that you too will spend some time in silence, looking not just at the cold, hard facts, but looking for healing, looking for transformation, and always, always looking for hope. Amen. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Transform us by your greatness, O God. Send us down the mountain to share joy with all people. Make us agents of change, confident that your hope will vanquish despair and your goodness will conquer evil. God of grace, hear our prayer. The mountains and valleys sing your praise. Dazzle us with your presence in every landscape. Bluffs built by ancient glaciers, canyons carved by flowing rivers, flat horizons with uninterrupted views, and sands shaped by ocean tides. God of grace, hear our prayer. You love justice and establish equity. Strengthen leaders of local governments, community nonprofits, and grassroots campaigns. Bless them with gifts of integrity, creativity, and sound conscience. Build up safe and joyful communities where all people may thrive. God of grace, hear our prayer. Heal those who are in distress. Give patience to those waiting for answers. Grant hope to those who have reached the limits of treatment. Give compassionate hearts to those who accompany loved ones through illness and uncertainty. God of grace, hear our prayer. Today we shout hallelujah from the mountaintop. This week, we enter the wilderness of Lent. Bless all who prepare and lead us in worship during this change of season. Pastors, deacons, musicians, and all who contribute to our worship life. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for your own intercessions. God of grace, hear our prayer. Blessed are they who listen to Christ's voice in this life and now rest with him. Transform us from glory into glory and give us your peace that we do not lose heart. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
A quick announcement and reminder this morning, for those of you who are giving cash, we ask that you put cash in an envelope for the offering, because um, cash holds all of those germy kinds of things, and this helps the offering people not to be exposed to all of that, okay? Um, if you're giving a check, then you can just simply write on the bottom um, which church uh, it's for. And if you don't write that, it goes to Shepherd, <laughs> okay? Uh, because, of course, Shepherd is hosting us here, and we're very grateful for that. If, you're, you, if you put cash in the offering plate, please use an envelope. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, we have some other announcements. Good morning. Uh, we had, uh, for Shepherd of the Valley, we were hoping that you were having your, um, your intended giving cards filled out and turned in by today. If you haven't turned them in yet, though, you know, please do that and bring them next week or send them in the mail or, or send them to the office. We want to um, collect all of these from our members so that we can plan for the future. So bring it next week or the week after and get them turned into us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Another important announcement this week is Ash Wednesday at 6.30 here at Shepherd. It's also, I, I presume it's the same in the Lutheran and Methodist church, it, but in our churches, um, we have been called to four days of prayer between now and Ash Wednesday for the peace, for peace in the world. And so I would encourage all of you to participate in that in any way that you can. When Andy returns, um, I'll be asking him about perhaps us doing a vigil so that we can pray. Prayer is not only some sort of, it's not like a magic trick that makes everything better, but sometimes it enables us to know where God would have us do something, whether that's responding to the needs of refugees or whatever that is in the world. And so um, let us enter, as we inch towards Lent, into a time of prayer, um, reflection, and hope. And thank you for that wonderful sermon today. I needed that. We pray for all our offerings. Blessed are you, O oh God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with this heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who, sharing our life, lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to your own brilliant light. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Almighty Lord, we praise your shining light, your glowing grace. From before the earth's foundation, you loved us and promised us life forever. Within the earth's deep sadness, we laud your great and glorious might. Despite our tears and sinning, we sing of the gladness of your mercy. We praise your Son, our morning star, Christ, our diamond bright, our treasure dear. He is our living Savior who has ransomed us in love. He keeps us yours and fails us never, today, tomorrow, and every day. On the night before his great salvation, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With joy we tell our story, Alleluia. Alleluia. We call your spirit on us and on this meal. Refresh our souls with this heavenly food, the body and blood of your Son. Nourish us as branches of your tree and enlighten us with your undying flame. We sing out to the Father, we ring out to the Son, we exalt in the Spirit. Transport us in our own yearning, and be for us the end and the beginning, our purest pleasure, our victorious crown, our never-ending love. And so we pray and praise, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Keep us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come to God's table. There is a place for you and enough for all.
the body of Christ given for you. the blood of Christ given for you. Let us pray together. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened with the riches of your grace and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name. Bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen.
Go with Christ into a weary world. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thank mm -hmm. you. 